Hello, welcome to Nothing But Net, our program that explores the global internet. My name is Rich Wiggins, and I'd like to introduce my partner in crime, Chuck Severance. Thanks, Rich. Well, one of the things we do on the show is we try to find URLs in strange places that we haven't yet found them. And, and What's a URL? Uniform Resource Locator. And I found a URL one place that we've not found. We found them just about everywhere. But I found one on a billboard. I found one on a southbound I-55 going out of Chicago, a billboard for a, an auto company. And the whole billboard was www.autosomething.com. So I was, that was the first time. And, and I, I wondered how long it would take for billboards would end up with URLs on it. Well, was there anything else or just the URL? Pretty much just the URL. Huh. So what's happened with you in the last month or so on the internet? Well, the web and the net, you can't avoid it no matter where you go to hide. And recently, Judy ordered us some Omaha steaks. Okay. So I don't know if you've ever ordered from these folks, but they ship steaks packed on dry ice. Yep. And so you open up the styrofoam container and you take out the steaks, but also in the container is an America Online <laughs> starter disk, frozen. Frozen? Did it work? Or do we, you have to put it in your microwave for a while? We don't use this to get to America Online. We use it as a spare floppy, but... Yeah. Wherever you go, you can't avoid these people. I think that's, it's the next alien invasion or something. Exactly. So what else you got going on? Well, in terms of uh, somewhat more serious uh, goings-on, I was off at a conference in Seattle called the Special Libraries Association. Yeah, you told me about that. And there was this fellow there, um, a fellow who you may have heard of, this guy Bill Gates, who spoke at the conference. He, has he heard of you? I don't know if he's heard of me or not, no. But I did speak myself a couple of times at the same conference. Okay. And as it happens, a year ago in Tokyo, I also spoke at a conference that Bill Gates spoke at. So my goal in life now is every year to speak at a conference that Bill Gates speaks at. What do you think? It's pretty impressive. Very, very impressive. How many people were at your, uh, at your talk? Oh, at each of them about 500. So oh, okay. not too bad. Hey, I was, uh, I was surfing the web and I came across a report uh, from this, uh, this uh, same SLA conference Oh yeah, and uh, it was uh, it was titled "A Net's Eye View of the uh, SLA Conference" uh, by uh, Shirley Doglin Kennedy, and uh, it's all about you. Oh no! It's all about you, and and they say good things about you. I don't know, perennially popular conference speaker, systems guru, Michigan. I'm I'm really impressed. There Perenni must have been a different different person. I not not the Rich Wiggins I know. Perennially popular, and I think that means I speak like a tulip. I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I think I might agree with you on that. <laughs> well, you know, Chuck, I was off at another conference called Internet World. I was there, too. And I, and I went and interviewed the product manager for Real Video, and that's going to be our on-the-road segment in today's show. And I was a little surprised in the middle of the interview when this happened. Is looking at this as a way to deliver content? Yeah, it's very popular for distance learning. Uh, we were just talking to a gentleman from uh, Michigan State University, and he has this entire curriculum that he teaches uh, internationally, worldwide, some courses where they actually subscribe. It's a password protected site, and the entire thing's taught in real video and real audio. Was his name Charles Severance? Uh, could be. He's the co host of this show. Oh, really? <laughs> So, you know, I'm innocently interviewing this guy, and, and what happens? But, you know, you've been there an hour earlier, and you're showing him all the cool things you're doing with Real Video. That's right, Rich. So, Wherever you're going, I'll have been there first. It's, I a, was it's impressed. one of your personal problems. <laughs> now, I talked that guy's arm off. I shouted at him about making it work on a 486 and, and all kinds of things, and they aren't got some really neat stuff planned. Well, the, the neat thing is he was willing to let me go ahead and interview him after all of that, and we're going to hear what he has to say about his product. Great. We'll talk a lot more about that in the rest of the show. Stay with us, we've got a lot more coming up on Nothing But Net. In our Internet for Everyone segment, Rich is going to tell us about streaming audio and video over the Internet. Thanks, Chuck. Folks have been trying to figure out good ways of sending audio and video on the Internet for several years now, and the technology has really come a long way in a short time. The basic problem is, how can we efficiently deliver audio and video over the Internet? 
How can someone listen to a radio program delivered over the internet, or sample a new rock video, or maybe tune into a lecture that's coming from a university far, far away, and how can we do all of this in real time? Let's talk for a second about the conventional way that information is downloaded over the internet. Now, you're sitting at your desktop using some sort of a web browser like Netscape Navigator or Microsoft Internet Explorer, and you send a URL or Uniform Resource Locator off to a web server somewhere. And that server, conventionally, is going to pick up that entire document that you've asked for and send it all back to your computer. When the entire document has been delivered to your computer, then and only then can you look at it, browse through it up and, up and down using the scroll bar or what have you. In the case of an audio document, this would mean that the entire document would be assembled on the hard disk, and you might spend more time getting the document down to your computer than the actual real time of the document you want to listen to. Now, streaming attacks this problem of audio delivery a little bit differently. With streaming, what we do is, once again, we're sitting running some sort of web browser software. But once we've asked for the document, then some special streaming communication takes place between a server and our browser and our computer. So let's say we've gone off to NPR.org, National Public Radio, and let's say we're trying to listen to the Star Spangled Banner. What's going to happen is the streaming player on our computer is going to ask for the dialogue to begin, and let's say the first few words, oh, say, can you, will be played, and they will be played in real time while the computer is then going off and getting the next chunk of information. Maybe see by the dawns and then later on early light. So it's sort of a race that's going on. Our computer is trying to deliver the information in analog form out the speaker. At the same time, it's trying to pull down the next chunk of information in digital form across the internet. Now, this concept of real-time audio was first popularized by a company called Progressive Networks, Incorporated, and they named their product Real Audio. The early versions of Real Audio had, quite frankly, not all that great fidelity. Today, the sound is pretty good, even if you're delivering it only over a 28.8 kilobit per second modem. Now, the higher the speed we've got, the better the fidelity. And so if you're listening, for instance, over a cable modem, you'll find that the quality is higher. Real-time video is a fairly recent growth area where folks have tried to figure out how can we stuff an entire video signal over a relatively small internet pipe. Let's say we wanted to send this actual television program over the internet, and we wanted to do it in full-frame, full-motion video. Well, even with compression, that could take the equivalent of what's called a T1 leased line. Now, that runs at the rate of 1.5 megabits a second, and for a lot of organizations, that's their entire internet feed. So this would mean that one straight video stream could consume an entire internet feed for an organization. So with today's technology and today's modems, most folks feel that they should stick to audio-only delivery, or they should use streaming video in a very small thumbprint with fairly slow scan rates. Delivering real-time data on the internet presents special challenges. The data has got to arrive at the end user's desktop at the selected data rate. Now, one way that we cope with this is we have a process of buffering. So your streaming player tries to pull in several seconds worth of material before it goes and actually starts playing. That way, if there's a little bit of a burp, a little bit of congestion in the internet, then it's got a little bit of a window in which to try to catch up. And really, quite frankly, it's remarkable how well this stuff actually works on today's internet. I'm a little bit pessimistic in one regard, and I'm afraid as more folks get into streaming multimedia, things are going to break down a little bit. So the, the process of buffering and the way that we do streaming media has some really good advantages. When we do this um, process of starting it off and playing it as it downloads, we don't have to assemble all of the information on our hard disk. And this means that we can actually participate um, almost instantaneously. And we have no problems worrying about spare disk space. Let's say you want to get in the business of serving real audio. How would you do this? Well, you can go get the encoder for free going and taking the data and putting it in the real audio format can be done with a tool that you can get for free. Then you're going to have to find a server somewhere that can deliver the data. And if you want to use a real audio streaming server, you're going to have to get a license, and every one of your listeners or viewers of video will count as one stream, every simultaneous listener. Your license, then, is based on the number of simultaneous streams. Now, in this month, as it happens, the progressive folks have announced that they will provide one free 60-stream licensed server for every company that asks for it. 
There's also a process of pseudo-streaming for folks who want to get going on their own. A personal user might use this approach. Without using a streaming server, you can simply put a file up in the real audio format or real video format on your web server. And then the HTTP or web dialog is the way that stuff will be delivered to your users. Now, it's not quite as robust as real audio streaming. It's the true streaming. But it is good enough for a lot of personal applications. We talked a little bit about the demands that all of this puts on the Internet. What, is, what this really involves is the Internet is a complicated network of switchers, or what's called routers, that move data around from one way station to another on the network. Probably we're going to have to have faster and faster routers and faster and faster Internet links if we want this to be efficient. We also, we also need to move to what's called multicasting. And let me give you an example of that. Let's say we are tuned into a real-time lecture somewhere across the net. Let's say 100 people are sitting in East Lansing, Michigan, listening to a lecture from Australia. With today's technology, we have 100 parallel redundant streams. And with multicasting, we would have one stream from Australia to East Lansing that fans out in East Lansing. And until we have that technology, real-time streaming for the masses can't really take off. Right, Chuck? Yeah, one of the things that uh, I noticed is you, you're right that the 28.8 video is very slow. But if you simply increase the video rate to 56 kilobits or 112 kilobits, the video begins to look very nice in some ways. And so for people with cable modems or intranets at work for training, the, the data rate does not have to go up very high. And one point that Real Audio makes is even if you have an intranet or a cable modem, doesn't mean that it's sort of infinite speed but it's much faster. So these slightly higher video rates that won't work on modems work very nicely over a faster medium. Good point, Chuck. Don't go away. Nothing but net's about to go on the road. Early in the life of the Real Audio product, I caught up with James Wells, the Vice President of Sales for the Progressive Networks Company. And more recently, at the Internet World Show in Chicago, I interviewed Paul Thelen, the Product Manager for Real Video. Let's hear what they had to say. My name is James Wells, and I'm with a company from Seattle, a little company from Seattle called Progressive Networks. We produce a product for the Internet called Real Audio. It allows the idea of what we call narrow casting. That is to take information in a very inexpensive way and get it to very specific points of interest and targets. Another large um, user of, uh, of real audio is education. Mm -hmm. you know, distance learning, the ability to, to provide a learning environment over time and over space. Uh, real video is the ability to stream video live over the internet, either live or on demand content, where you don't have to wait for a download and then it'll immediately start playing when you click on a, on a clip. Uh, in real video right now we have over 2,000 sites that are using real video. We're increasing about 100 sites uh, a week. Uh, right now you can watch Fox News 24 hours a day live. There's about a dozen and a half other live 24 hour a day. 24 hours a day TV stations. Um, in addition to our heritage, which is Real Audio, which has over 600 live radio stations broadcasting 24 hours a day, seven days a week. All the live television stations I talked about are at 20 kilobits. We actually authored 20 for 28 dial-up users to take care of the fluctuation in actual throughput. Well, at a cable modem, uh, you get a much higher uh, range of video. We generally find that our size of video that we work with, 176 by 144, or SIF, which is VHS resolution, 320-240, works very well at 100 to 300 kilobits. So it's still a very small file compared to traditional, like MPEGs, which are huge, and hog bandwidth. Yet you get very clear, almost pixel-perfect video. We just announced last Monday that uh, Microsoft is actually uh, investing a 10% equity stake in our company. Uh, what they get, and they also invested some money, revenue money, into our 4.0 uh, real video server and free player technology. Um, 
real video and real player technology. Uh, there also will be bundling our real player 4.0 with Internet Explorer. So basically every new PC that ships with Windows will have our player already installed on it. So there's no need to download a plugin or anything, which has been one of the complaints of streaming media in the past. I don't know if it's up to date with their future internet products. They have one coming out called Site Server. It will be bundled in there. It'll be a 60 stream real video server. We're also now announced on Monday we're basically giving away our 60 stream versions of our server for free. It's called the Easy Start. It's basically an entry point to allow people to try it out, use it, and if they like it and they're successful, we'll move up to the professional line of service. Almost two years ago, James Wells from Progressive Networks told me how we're going to have a training model where we'll have audio and coordinated still shots. And as we heard earlier, Paul Thalen of Progressive is really impressed with the work that Chuck's doing. And I think it's really state of the art in terms of training over the internet. Well, well thanks, Rich. I, you know, part of the thing I believe that you're supposed to do at a university is play around. You play with fancy toys and you push things. And I'm, I'm very proud of the work we're doing with this uh, inter introduction to internet class. But I think in a few months, I think you're going to find classes all over the place. And the first 200 of them are probably going to be introduction to internet classes because <laughs> that's a fun thing to, to teach about. And so I want to show you a little bit of the, of the video. What this is is coordinated multimedia events where I sit. And in the first one, you'll see I'm in my office. But I sit and uh, tape the lectures, and then I have PowerPoint that I coordinate to go. And so you can sort of see me talking slowly. And then uh, you'll see the PowerPoint that, that coordinates. So I'll go ahead and start this. Now, the user gets to this. It's just a normal sort of web browser view, right? Right. And right. I call that nerds at work and play. During this phase, very few people relative to today were on the internet. Now, if you'll notice, I can jump ahead, and this is one of the advantages of streaming media mentioned. I can just jump right ahead to a new place in the lecture, and it will Even load the appropriate slide. Using dial -up modems. You would retrieve the information, you would convert it into whatever so it format you want to view it, and then you would view it. Right. It, you record the time periods in which you're supposed to show a particular slide. And so I've got software that puts this all together. And, uh, and students find this very useful. The interesting thing I found. Uh, let me pause this for a second. The interesting thing I found is that students actually listen to this not as actively as they might listen to a regular lecture. What the, but if you say something interesting, they like the ability to back up you know, and replay that again and again and again and again. And I designed the homework to make the students want to listen to the lecture more than once as they see the homework. Well, so it's do, pretty do you neat. even expect that they will tend to listen to the entire lecture once straight through? No, I don't. No, I don't. Although I know some students do that. I would sort of expect they'll print the homework out and then sit there with the homework and listen to the lecture, but at least it forces them to listen to the lecture. I've but, sort of got mixed feelings about this. In some ways, it's great. In other ways, it's so, sort of for the MTV generation that, that has no attention span. Yeah, but the, the, one of the problems, I mean, if, as a professor, you say to yourself, are we putting ourselves out of business by putting ourselves up on the internet? And, and I think if, if we were going to do that, CD-ROMs would put us out of business, and, and 16 millimeter film would have put us out of business, blah, blah, blah. I mean, at some point, we've yeah. been able to record lectures a long time. And I find that the big difference between this kind of class and regular class is the interaction and the fact that I'll talk to a student and it'll change what I say the next day. And so that's what the internet, I think, brings to this whole table. Well, now, how much production overhead is there for, for putting this together? Well, we have a whole bunch of nifty state-of-the-art television facilities at Michigan State University, and now they're helping me create this stuff. Um, but let me show you a little bit about putting one of these things together. As, uh, as they mentioned, the real video encoder is free, and you can simply download it. So we're going to use the real video encoder. And if you notice, I have a, a small quick cam camera here. You take a look at it. It's uh, just a small, this is a, a, an inexpensive, about $100 grayscale. A little over 200 you can get a color one. The color ones are much nicer. I did my first lecture with a color quick cam, and the rest of them I've done in the studio. So I want to show you how you set up a session. And you can see the video that's being captured on the quick cam on the left-hand side. And I've set it up to capture from this quick cam. And I'm going to capture a 28-8 video. And uh, so here I'll say start. So now we are making a movie. Now you see it's slowing down just a little bit. And <clears throat> the motion is slowed down, because what we're doing is we're doing 28.8. OK, and I'll do a kind of a ca uh, cable modem thrill cam here. And so we'll, we'll see we've moved to the back of the cable modem and seen the cable connection and then the twisted pair connection. And we're moving down to the control connection. OK, and we get, we're getting about a frame. I'll stop it now. We get about a frame every, uh, we get a frame every few seconds. Uh -huh. And the, the key is, is this is 28.8 quality video. And, and that video that we just shot and the corresponding audio would have worked at about 28.8. And that's what I want to have work in my classes, is make it so anyone over a modem can see it. Later, as we have faster modems like cable modems or ISDN, then I can have much faster uh, connections. So let me just play that real quick. We don't have any 
don't know if we'll have audio or not. Uh, where's the player? There's the player. Um, file, play. So there you are. And you see that you see a frame every once in a while, about every two seconds. Uh -huh. But that's what you're capable But there's audio that's also coming down at the same time. And so that's sort of the software that you end up using. And that's exactly the software use it, what we use in the studio to produce the class classes for my class. But sort of the breakthrough thought that I think the progressive people had was your face, while admittedly very important, doesn't really need to be captured in full fidelity. We can have sort of a slow scan, small image of you, but the slide that has the information, that comes up one every 30 seconds, once a minute. Right. And that needs to be in high fidelity so people can see it. Exactly. And some students just listen to the audio. They don't even need the video. If it's only going to change every second or so, it adds just a little bit, but not a great deal. So even audio over a 14-4 modem with slides is very a, a good educational situation. So you heard it here first, folks. Real video plus coordinated slides is going to be an important way that educational material will be delivered over the Internet in the future. I, I think you're absolutely correct, Rich. And coming up, we're going to hear from Rich on the news of the net. Now let's see what's going on in the news of the net. Microsoft may be leaving the internet access business. There are rumors that Microsoft sees no future in this particular line of business. It may be that it's hard to make money at the $20 flat fee that a lot of companies are charging for internet access. The rumor is that Microsoft will concentrate on building content for its Microsoft network site. And uh, officials of Microsoft are denying these rumors. A company has claimed that it owns trademark to the word internet. Honors Technologies, which operates a number of ATMs, say that that word is for them to use and nobody else. Don Heath, the chief executive of the Internet Society, says, we think this is preposterous. Well, what is in a name? A company has bought the Internet domain name, business.com, and the rumor is that they paid $150,000 for this name. The buyer is unknown. Another rumor has it that Meckler Media has bought .com for $250,000. The U.S. government has allowed the export of some encryption software. PGP software has been given an export license so that 128-bit encryption software can be sent outside U.S. borders. Significantly, there's no key escrow requirement in this case, as there had been in the past. PGP is a company that sells tools under the name Pretty Good Privacy. A company is going to help owners of music copyright track down people that are violating that copyright on the Internet. Intersect Inc. has a spider that will go out and find content that's been distributed around the web. It will report back the domain name, the service provider, and so forth that are delivering the data. IBM and Digimark are other companies that are looking at digital watermark technologies. NetGuide is dead. NetGuide magazine, which was published by CMP, had a circulation of 400,000 readers and also a companion website. CMP has decided to concentrate on other endeavors. What's Windows 98 going to look like? Well, apparently it's going to look a lot like the web. Windows 98 will have a web browser look and feel. Users will point and click to navigate their desktop. Web pages, Excel spreadsheets, Microsoft Word documents will all be treated the same. So that your view of the desktop and your view of the World Wide Web will be the same. You know, Rich, that, that last story is interesting to me because I've been hearing about this, the fact that Windows is going to look like your desktop and take over your desktop and it's going to look like the web. And, and I have yet to find a person who thinks that's a, a positive step. And, and I think that, let me give you a little example. For example, I have Office 97. And I'll type a memo and I have URLs in my memo, right? I say, dear so-and-so, we're going to do this URL. And all of a sudden, Microsoft Word will notice I'm typing a URL and turn it into a hot link for me. And it's like, wait, wait, I'm typing a memo here. I'm not writing a web page. And so, you know, Microsoft has done great things because I've seen PowerPoint and they do mm -hmm. some really neat things. So, so I don't know. I think the, but maybe in two years it'll, or a year or two, it'll be the one. I, I have mixed feelings about that. I think it's a good idea for the purposes of browsing and it's a bad idea for the purposes of authoring. Uh, 
Yeah. So if I am putting data in a spreadsheet, I need to know that this is an Excel spreadsheet and right. I do Excel type things while I'm working with it. But if I'm just pointing and clicking and reading data, That's then maybe true. the web metaphor makes sense. Cool. Well, we got a little bit more time left. Let's go back to the real web. Yeah, let's take. Let's surf. We got just a little bit more time left. We're we're at the Jacksonville Jaguars online site, and I want to, we talked. This, we've been talking about broadcasting and narrowcasting, and I want to show you a little bit about this site. We we'll go to the press box here, and okay. um, go to the press box. And there are lots of things that, that I imagine that people would like to see at the end of football games. And one of the things is the, the coaches and what they do after the game and the, the reviews they do. So we'll take a look at some of the video of some of the coaches at Jacksonville Jaguars right after, the, right after the game. Now, in this case, we're using a streaming video technology that's a little different than what we were talking about earlier. This is VDO Live, right? Right. Right, and this is a competitor to Real Audio, and I think that they actually had the uh, the embedded player sort of before Real Audio in some ways, because the one I, we saw VDO very very quite a long time ago. So, and what we're doing now is we're doing that buffering that you talked about. They certainly were after losing three games in a row. Yeah. Just talk a little bit about what you saw there. Well, there's a veteran team playing at home that overcame some things. And really, the important point here, I think, is that it's whatever audio content you want, when you want it, on demand. You can listen to this right after the game or a week later. Right, and, and if the coach like makes a big fuss or throws a chair at somebody, you're going to see it on ESPN. But if they don't, you're not going to see it. And if you truly are aficionado of football. You're going to want to see this stuff. So you get what you want when you want it. Exactly. Well, I guess we're about out of time. Okay, well then we'll see you on the net. <laughs>